Hello and welcome to another Adventures with Alchemy. Today we are discussing absinthe. <laughs> yes, absinthe. Ooh, yes, absinthe. The taboo spirit of rock stars, artists, and writers. Man, people like Trent Reznor, Ernest Hemingway, Edgar Allan Poe, and so many other super cool people all were fans and are fans of absinthe. But what is absinthe? Well, absence is a lot of things, but primarily it is a spirit made from uh, a neutral spirit of grapes that is flavored with uh, fennel, anise, and wormwood, amongst other things. Um, it has a very interesting history and it has a lot of myths. Today we're going to debunk a few of those, well we're going to debunk those myths and we're going to go over some of that history and we are going to try a little absence. So, please. Stick around and enjoy our episode on absinthe. Let's do this. So, absinthe comes from Switzerland. We'll just get that right out of the way. But the use of wormwood dates all the way back to Egyptian times. Um, we know this because there is a ancient medical journal called the Ebers Papyrus, 1550 BC. It's a scroll of sorts um, that basically talks about uh, wormwood being dipped in wine, uh, wormwood leaves, and the wine being used for medicinal purposes and the leaves being used for medicinal purposes. So um, we know that all the way back then they were using wormwood. But what we're going to talk about is what was going on in the late 1700s where distillation of absinthe is, comes into play and people start drinking it and enjoying it and it becomes uh, more than just an elixir for um, for what else yeah so let's get to the beginnings of the birth of absinthe so the first time we see a distilled spirit with green anise fennel and uh, wormwood being used is back in the 18th century by a major Dubade and I'm sorry I'm probably butchering that name <clears throat> but major Dubade or Dubwe I'm sorry major Dubade D-U-B-A-D B-A-I-D um, opened the first absinthe distillery in 1797, but we were seeing this being made around 1792, is right when we were seeing the, the spirit being made by Major Dubade. Um, he, his daughter uh, married a young man um, who was part of the Pernod family. Uh, they were not called Pernod at the time, it was like Pede Noir or something like that, a much longer name. And over time, by the time the second distillery was opened, um, the the techniques and the recipes had been handed down into the Pernod family and the young man Henry Louis Pernod opened the second distillery and it was now under the Pernod name. And of course we know that name to this day, uh, one of the most famous names and that are synonymous with absinthe. Of course the Pernod family, the Pernod distillery um, in 1797 was uh, opened right on the border of France, on the other side of France. So that's why some people believe that absinthe comes from France, but that's not, that's not true. We know Switzerland. So um, in the 1840s, uh, the French were using absinthe to give to the troops and, as, uh, as a cure for malaria and other illnesses. And what happened was those troops uh, gained a taste for it. They acquired a taste for absinthe and they brought it home with them. So you had um, all these troops coming home that now have this taste for absinthe. It becomes very popular. They're ordering it in drinks, I mean in bars, cafes. Um, and different places like that. And um, yeah, it just, it, it blows up. It's now the new hip thing to drink. So in the 19th century in France, there was a period known as the Belle Epoque. And the Belle Epoque was a time of like a renaissance of arts and culture. And absinthe was in the center of it all. Um, like I said earlier, people like Ernest Hemingway, Pablo Picasso, Vincent van Gogh, Oscar Wilde, they loved absinthe and they talked all about it. So it, it really, really gained popularity quickly. And at the same time, a disease called phylloxera actually devastated the wine industry in France. And because of that, you had you know, a, a, um, a shortage of wine and you have now absinthe that's gaining in popularity. So suddenly, there is a threat, a real threat to the wine industry, or at least a perceived threat to the wine industry when it comes to the owners of the wine industry. So they didn't like that. They all got together 
and came up with this plan to basically bury their competition by outlawing them. So they created this smear campaign, this negative propaganda that was meant to create this, this perception that absinthe was deadly, that it was poison, that it would make you hallucinate and go crazy and, and you would kill your wife. And unfortunately, some things happened to coincide, to back up that, um, that storyline, that, uh, that propaganda, if you will. They, there was a couple of uh, violent incidents that were brought upon in the news. A gentleman killed his family after drinking way too much alcohol one night. What happened was he had two glasses of absinthe, but also had four bottles of wine and a lot of cognac that day. Drank a lot. Obviously, the man had problems. And he went home and he you know, committed a heinous act. But the, the news focused specifically on the absinthe part in order to make a point. So that was the famous case that, you know, helped ban absinthe for a long time. But over time, uh, people learned that it, that all that was pretty much bullshit. And, you know, now we can enjoy absinthe again. Um, it, w it pretty much started with uh, the UK um, because it wasn't banned all over the world. It was banned mostly throughout most of the countries. There was still a few um, countries where it wasn't illegal and those countries you know kept the circulation going and people traveling would just get it from the UK or other places and bring it home and share it <clears throat> with their friends and family and that's where the whole myth of uh, oh, oh I have real absence you know not the camera yeah, real absence that will uh, that'll do the trick guys there's no such thing as just a real apps all absence is real there is no such absinthe that is real, that is gonna make you hallucinate and see green fairies. That is all myths, okay? So just debunk, let's just debunk that right now. If you thought that absinthe did that at any point in time in history, no. But what did happen was, just like with bootleg alcohol, people tried to make bootleg absinthe when it was illegal. And they would use things like copper salts to give it that green, you know, f um, uh, color and unfortunately copper salts are poisonous um, and not just copper salts but other chemicals as well so you know bathtub gin bathtub absinthe that stuff when made wrong will kill you and maybe make you hallucinate on the road to death so uh, <laughs> maybe that's where it came from I don't know but yeah let's just bury that uh, let's just bury that that uh, that myth let's put that to rest now okay absence does not make you hallucinate even if you drink tons of it, you'll just get really drunk. You might see something, I don't know. Yeah, March 5th, 2007 was when the ban on absinthe in the United States was finally lifted. St. George absinthe is made right here in California. It is a delicious absinthe. It is made in the classic way like Lafitte or Pernod does theirs. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of great cocktails to make with absinthe on top of just drinking absinthe by itself. Um, Corpse Survivor number two is my favorite. Absinthe Frap is another. And we will probably make an episode where you're going to see me make those drinks, but not today. Today we're just going to focus on the star of the show, which is absinthe, and how to pour absinthe, which is what we're going to do next. Now what you see in front of me, and in front of you, is an absinthe fountain. A little green fairy on the top, right? I love that. So you put water and ice inside the bulb. You have these spigots. You have your absinthe glass. You have the two sections on the glass. You have the little, the, the, the oh, I, don't, I don't know what to call it, but you have the little, the little uh, bulb right here on the bottom, which is where you put your two or two and a half ounces of absinthe. You have the area on top, which is about five ounces, which is supposed to take the water. On top, you have your absinthe spoon, which is a really pretty flat spoon with uh, some ridges on each end to kind of hold on to the glass. And that's where you put your sugar cube. You start to slowly drip water over the sugar cube, which goes into the absinthe. It is called a luge when all the goodies become suspended and separated. You see it all becomes very cloudy. Uh, as you can see, one of the absinthe is green and the other one is yellow. Uh, my guess is because one is using more green anise than the other, or one is using green anise and the other one is not using green anise. This absinthe comes from Austria and this absinthe comes from California. Both are really, really good. Um, both have very heavy anise flavors. 
Um, this, the St. George, I tend to taste a little bit more of the fennel in that one. Um, and uh, you're going to see as we we pour, uh, as we drip the water on, how it begins to change, how it begins to get all cloudy. And by the time it gets to the top, well, the sugar cube should be fully dissolved and or at least all in the water. And then you just tip the, the spoons in, give it a stir and you drink. So let's begin. Begin by just slowly giving this a turn. There you go. You see, it slowly just starts to create our luge for us. So while this is going on, usually this is the time when the bartender is talking, giving the whole spiel as to the history and debunking myths, so to speak, um, while this process happens. And uh, yeah. Okay, so the glasses are full. Now all that's left to do is you take your spoon like this, drop it on in, okay? This is where you give it a little stir until the rest of that sugar is nice and dissolved. Some people like to leave some salt grain, I mean salt, some sugar granules on the bottom. As I see that as kind of a little prize at the end. Yeah, it's up to you. I only need one. Uh, they're both really good. They are different. Flavor profile wise, they both are gonna be very, ah, they're both going to be very um, anise forward. But as you can see, there are differences in color. So there will be some differences in flavor. That's delicious. It's after you add the water and the sugar, everything just kind of comes together beautifully. There's reasons for everything. Everything has its purpose. So it's not like a knock you in the, in the face backwards of black licorice. It's it's nice it's it's there but it, it, it you taste the other ingredients as well as you breathe more character comes out you can taste the fennel a little bit more and taste the wormwood no i mean it's nice it's really nice now let's see the difference with this one interesting this one has more of a bitterness to it this one has more of a sweet this is more of a bitter finish the the anise isn't as predominant on this one as it's here it is it is present but it's not the it's not like the star the green the green and i mean i'm sorry the green fennel is there too obviously because of the color but the the taste is there and yeah, I get this really pleasant bitterness at the end. It's just real nice. It's real nice. Mm. I do find it just a tad bit bland compared to this one. Um, St. George's has a lot more character to it. Uh, there's just, there's just more of everything. There's just more fennel, there's just more anise, there's just more of the, almost like a, like a, I don't know, like a chocolatey almost there at the end. Um, and that slight bitterness at the end too. The, the, this one, it just tastes more watered down, I guess. It's not bad, but, uh, I would give this to somebody who doesn't drink, um, absinthe very often, maybe for their first time doing it this way. This is, uh, this is just like anybody who likes absinthe or, or an anti set of any sort. This is delicious. This is delicious. Don't be afraid of the stuff, guys. I'm not a huge fan of black licorice either, but everything, when it's done right, 
when it's put together correctly and when it's when it's enjoyed correctly then you'll find that you like more things than you probably think you do um, you know I'm not a huge fan of Zambuca either but given the right circumstances with the right food with the right people and I mean the right variables Zambuca's fantastic so give it a shot guys get out there don't be afraid not all absinthe is the same go get yourself a bottle of fee or a bottle of st george cold water do things right <clears throat> and try it out okay cheers my friends to good health to good friends and to a good life cheers guys if you love what we do here if you enjoy our show and you want to see more please like subscribe and spread the word. We appreciate all of your all of your support, all of the kind words, and especially any sort of recommendations or ideas that you throw at us because that helps a lot. That shows that you care, that you are watching, and that you want to see something special. So please, I'm down. That's how this episode came about. People ask for absence, you got it. So I'm always listening and I'm always happy to please. All right. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. See you on the next one.